order, um, and I'm uh, Congressman Darren LaHood, uh, the chair of the Work and Welfare Subcommittee, and I want to welcome everybody uh, to this um, Work and Welfare Subcommittee hearing today in the city of Chicago, and so proud to have uh, the members of the Ways and Means Committee here today for this important hearing. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me just acknowledge uh, Pastor Phil uh, and the folks here at Pacific Garden Mission for the work they've done to make this hearing come about. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, a lot of work went into putting this together, and uh, so we're thrilled uh, to have a wonderful venue to have our hearing today. And it's not often that we get um, 10 members of Congress outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, to come out uh, to uh, Chicago. But today's field hearing is reflective of that in a bipartisan way uh, to have members of the Ways and Means Committee here and specifically the Work and Welfare Subcommittee. I also want to acknowledge um, uh, Congressman Danny Davis. We're in his district here. Uh, it, yes. Yay! And for him to welcome us here. Um, I, I'm proud to represent the 16th District of Illinois, which is a little uh, south and, and west of here. Uh, my home is Peoria. I also represent Bloomington Normal and the city of Rockford. Uh, and then I extend out into DeKalb County, McHenry County, and Grundy County. And so it's an honor and privilege to represent the constituents of the 16th District and to be here today uh, for this important hearing. Um, so uh, we, we, Congressman Davis and I, work on the Work and Welfare Subcommittee, which has responsibility of overseeing several important federal anti-poverty programs that provide assistance to vulnerable children and families. And we're very lucky, obviously, to be here today uh, at Pacific Garden Mission and to, to see the work here to uplift and restore the lives of homeless individuals and families in, here in Chicago. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to visit Project Hood from, and Pastor Corey Brooks. We did a field, a site uh, hearing or a site visit yesterday uh, at, in um, Inglewood, and we learned about the important work that Pastor Brooks and his team are doing to uplift and transform lives in Inglewood and Woodlawn, including building a new community center there. One of the things that has stood out to me about both of these organizations is their philosophy of uplifting. Uh, and equipping individuals in crisis with skills and tools to find stability and transform their lives through faith and work. How do we define help matters? Whether it's through churches, nonprofits, private foundations, or government programs, when providing relief and assistance to those in need, we should be exploring every possibility to promote work as, a, as the surest pathway out of poverty. No amount of handouts or government assistance, no matter how well-intentioned, can substitute for the intangible benefits and dignity that work brings to individuals and their families and the ripple effect it has on our communities. All of our government programs need to be oriented to provide every opportunity for individuals to grow their capacity and be connected to meaningful work. At the most fundamental level, work provides income and greatly reduces the likelihood of being in poverty. Simply working, even part-time, dramatically reduces the chances <coughs> excuse me, of living below the poverty line. In 2021, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that only 4.1 of individuals <coughs> who worked part-time over a period of at least 27 weeks had incomes below the poverty line, and only 2.6 of those who worked full-time. Beyond providing a reliable source of income, work also provides countless intangible benefits to individuals. Research has shown that work is associated with improved physical and mental health, social well-being, and higher degrees of human connectedness and social capital. Conversely, studies have linked joblessness with increased social isolation, depression, anxiety, and feelings of hopelessness. Joblessness can even affect physical health. One study found that unemployment lasting longer than six months can reduce life expectancy by as much as a year and a half for a 40-year-old worker. Tying federal benefits to the expectation of work is not punishment. Work in exchange for benefits represents society's commitment to helping individuals and families in crisis. In fact, most Americans support work as a condition of welfare. A 2023 Axios poll found nearly two-thirds of Americans, including half 
of Democrats support work requirements for welfare programs. As part of this committee's ongoing efforts to restore work requirements to federal programs, in 2023, we secured, we secured a major victory by strengthening work requirements for families receiving temporary assistance for needy families, known as TANF, cash assistance, as part of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. The bipartisan law closed loopholes to hold states accountable for engaging TANF work eligible individuals in work and established pilot programs to measure recipient employment and earnings outcomes to test alternative measures of performance. But more can be done. Conducting these field hearings like we're doing today gives us an opportunity to hear directly from people who have overcome the odds to escape poverty and the organizations and leaders that do the hard work every day to help individuals transform their lives. And we'll hear from some of those remarkable individuals today as our witnesses. I want to again thank our witnesses for being here today and for the Pacific Garden mission, and I look forward to the testimony we'll hear. With that, I'm pleased now to recognize uh, Mr. Davis, um, our ranking member, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for holding this field hearing. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to my home city of Chicago. There was a time when we would say it has Wrigley Field, Soldier Field, Marshall Field, and it sits by a lake of some size. <laughs> but I'm pleased to be here with all of you at the Pacific Garden Mission and to have visited Project Hood yesterday. Both organizations serve people in need so well. Democrats and President Biden have put helping workers overcome barriers to sustainable quality employment at the heart of our policies. Even in this time of economic growth, where wages have risen and unemployment has been cut in half, too many people are left out, not because they prefer needing government help, but because they face significant barriers to quality employment. Some don't have child care or need paved lead to deal with an illness or care for an elderly parent. Some lack the skills or education needed for good jobs. Some have jobs but don't earn enough to make ends meet, like the 6.4 million working poor. Some made mistakes in the past and can't get a second chance. I am proud that Democrats provided emergency aid to preserve child care centers and permanently increased federal child care investment by over $600 million a year, about $20 million of it right here in Illinois. I'm proud that Democrats expanded the child tax credit that slashed child poverty to just 5.2% percent in Illinois. Unfortunately, that poverty cut in child tax credit expired due to Republican inaction, and child poverty is back up to 12.4 percent, an unacceptable outcome. If our goal is to support work to help people escape poverty, then people don't need more penalties, requirements, and paperwork. Parents need guaranteed child care and paid family and medical leave that we know substantially increase workforce participation among women. People need a safe place to live, food to eat, reliable transportation, good education, and health care to obtain the stability needed to work successfully. I strongly disagree with those that blame people for their poverty and suggest that the solution is low or no wage jobs with work requirements to make sure they don't develop a dependency mentality. Denying people food, housing, enough money to pay the rent, and making them work for free doesn't give them dignity. I am proud to showcase the work done at the SAFER Foundation 
to overcome the systemic barriers faced by justice-involved individuals so they can get good jobs and turn their lives around. I worked with SAFER to set up an amazing program to help people with records obtain careers in healthcare. The program involves intensive training, coupled with legal services, support services, technical assistance for businesses, and job placement services. There we are here. Over three years, the initiative placed 113 clients with 71 employers and achieved a 93% retention rate over two years. Our subcommittee should support programs like SAFER that methodically address the multiple barriers struggling workers face. As we sit in a mission, I'm reminded of 2017 when the Republican Congress enacted a bill to tax faith-based organizations on the value of their parking and benefits provided to employees to pay for tax cuts for wealthy individuals and corporations. I heard a lot from faith-based organizations in Illinois about the church parking tax. Democrats repealed this tax in 2019. But the wealthy who benefited from those tax breaks will soon ask Congress to extend their tax cuts. My hope is that my Republican colleagues will protect the programs that help people live with dignity and not make them subsidize tax cuts for the wealthy again. As a black American who grew up in the segregated South and who came to Chicago for the opportunities that were not as available in the South, I know firsthand how systemic barriers limit opportunities. It has been my honor to devote my congressional career to work like we do in the subcommittee to help those who are struggling to overcome systemic barriers with the education, jobs, child care, paid family and medical leave, and other supports so that they can thrive. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about our work, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Davis. It's now. It's now my pleasure to um, introduce the uh, chairman of the Full Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Smith of Missouri. And when Mr. Smith took over as our leader on the committee, he talked about doing a number of field hearings. And I think this is our ninth or tenth field hearing that we've done over the last year and a half, getting out across America to hear from individuals on what we can do better in Washington, D.C. And so it wasn't just rhetoric, it is the reality that uh, we're doing these field hearings. And so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our chairman, Mr. Smith of Missouri. Thank you, Chairman LaHood and Ranking Member Davis. It's not, it's not often that a subcommittee is led by the chair and the ranking member from the same state. Um, and so I'm glad we could visit Illinois to hear from folks that you both, both represent. So thanks for the hospitality of hosting us, uh, Ranking Member Davis. I also want to thank Pastor Phil. Um, thank you all so much and your entire team here at Pacific Garden Mission for hosting our committee. Um, today, we are Today, we are actually making history. This is the first time in congressional history that a standing House committee has held a hearing in a homeless shelter. Way overdue. <laughs> Pacific Garden Mission is the oldest faith-based homeless shelter in the country, providing help to men and women across Chicago since 1877. The work you do is critically important to helping those in need transform their lives. Most importantly, what you do here is about not giving up on people. That's why we are having the hearing today. We are in Chicago to listen to the real stories of individuals whose lives were transformed by work and what it takes to shepherd those in crisis 
from poverty to independence. Taxpayers fund a fragmented and often confusing safety net system that spans more than 80 different federal programs at a cost of more than $1 trillion every year. These programs provide important food, housing, health care, and cash assistance to help those in poverty. However, as federal support has grown, programs have largely failed to focus on how to help lift people back into full self-sufficiency. Instead, success is measured by how many new people are added to the roles of these programs. This approach discourages people from seeking a path to work. As a result, more people are receiving welfare benefits today than at any time in our nation's history. In 2023, 85 million people were enrolled in Medicaid, an increase of 20% since 2019. This represents 25% of the U.S. population, one-fourth of the U.S. populations on Medicaid. In 2023, 41 million people received food assistance through SNAP, an increase of 18% since 2019. This represents 12% of the entire population. What we've lost sight of is that a job is the best anti-poverty program that exists. Work is more than a paycheck. Every person has skills and abilities they can offer to their community. Often it is just connecting those skills with the right job. When people are not able to apply their talents, they miss out on the dignity that comes from work and their communities are denied their contributions. Relying on a government check can weaken an individual's ability to use and grow their skills. Instead of climbing out of poverty, families find themselves without hope and trapped with fewer options for their future. Children with parents who are unable to find meaningful employment often struggle in school and they face more severe mental health issues, contributing to a generational cycle of poverty. In fact, one in every three children who grow up in poverty will raise their own children in poverty. We must break the cycle. Clearly, the path from welfare to work is not easy or straightforward. Folks often must first overcome the barriers that contribute to poverty, like mental health or educational challenges, substance abuse, health problems, neglect. Too often, however, community leaders find themselves battling against so-called solutions from Washington that make it harder for individuals to escape poverty. We know as much from recent history under the American Rescue Plan Act, the child tax credit was transformed from a program that rewards work to one that does not. And Democrats extended unemployment benefits that paid people more not to work. As a consequence, a government check was worth more than a paycheck and millions of families sat on the sidelines. It is not the fault of those families. They were just responding to the incentives of Washington, which they provided. There's more that we can and we should do. Last year, as part of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, Republicans led changes to strengthen work requirements and the temporary assistance for needy families and supplemental nutrition assistant programs. Last month, Republican members on our committee introduced legislation that would protect taxpayer dollars provided through TANF from being lost to waste, fraud, and abuse. We are here because we want to hear from those on the front lines of this crisis. There will be clipboards that our team will be passed out for anyone in the audience to share any concerns or ideas. We will enter those into 
the official record and take them back with us to Washington as we consider how policies can better connect people to work and lift more Americans out of poverty. Thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony and thank you, Chairman LaHood. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman Smith, for that. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our witnesses here today. We have six of them uh, and um, we'll start off with um, uh, Mr. Matt Paprocki, who's the president and CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute. He's also uh, the CEO of the Center for Poverty Solutions and a real thought leader here in Chicago. Uh, next, we'll hear from Nathan Montgomery, who's the executive director of Salt and Light in Urbana, Illinois. Um, our next witness will be Brian Butler, who's from my hometown of Peoria, Illinois, and is the director of residential ministries at Pathway uh, in Peoria. And then next, we'll hear from Christy Schofield, also from Peoria, and is the director of homelessness and housing at the Dream Center. Uh, in Peoria, Illinois. Next, we'll hear from Gianno Cardwell, um, who is the founder of Caldwell Stra uh, Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., but a native of Chicago and proud of his Chicago heritage. And lastly, we'll hear from Sadiqa Williams, who's the vice, senior vice president of the Safer Foundation here in Chicago. Um, you'll all be recognized for five minutes, and we'll begin with you, Mr. Paprocki. Thank you, Chairman Smith. Uh, Chairman LaHood and Ranking Member Davis and the distinguished members of this committee. My name is Matt Paprocki. I'm the founder of the Center for Poverty Solutions, a project created from the Illinois Policy Institute where I serve as president and CEO. Today in my testimony, I want to demonstrate why work is the best pathway out of, out of poverty and to give people dignity. And I want to end by giving three solutions that this committee can do to enact that. But first, let me give you some background. The Center for Poverty Solutions was created to look at uh, the research behind what are the biggest drivers to eradicate poverty. And we work with direct service agencies, partner together, and we pass bipartisan legislation to reduce poverty and increase opportunities. Our goal is to eliminate poverty starting here in the city of Chicago. And I have good news. We have one single factor that can reduce poverty by 87%. It's work. In fact, those people who are working a full-time job, only 2% of them are currently in poverty. Take, for example, my friend Stephen Blake. Stephen was a homeless veteran. But thanks to this place here, uh, Pacific Garden Mission, he was given shelter and job training. Today, Stephen is an entrepreneur who sells fresh fruits to commuters on their way to work. Two months ago, I walked by Stephen on this cold, freezing day. It's raining outside. And I saw Stephen there. I said, Stephen, what are you doing out here today? And Stephen points to a man a few feet away from us, and he's holding a sign, and the cardboard sign says, please help. And he said, Matt, that used to be me. He said, I stood out here every single day, and every person who walked by, I would ask them, how can you help me? He said, today I do the opposite. Every single person who walks by, I say, how can I help you? A huge smile comes across his face. He said, Matt, I got to be out here. People need me. That's dignity. That's a dignity that's enshrined in our Constitution, in the phrase, in the pursuit of happiness. That's a dignity that lifts people closer to the image and the likeness of God. That is a dignity that lifts people out of men mental illness, out of abuse, and out of dependency. Quite frankly, this is what's missing in our society today. A society which often tells people, you can't do it. Because poverty today is less about food and housing insecurity, and it's becoming more about hopelessness, independence. Meaningful work can solve all of these problems. I know, because I've lived it. When I was 24 years old, I was a professional staffer, and I got a call from my mom. She said, Matt, I'm at the hospital, and I've just been diagnosed with cancer. So I left the job that I love because my mom needed me. And for the next eight months, I stayed at home with her. And one cold December day, she died in my arms. And I lost my purpose. I had no job. I had no money. I had no parents. Nobody needed me. For the next few months, I qualified for just about every welfare benefit there was. And I thank God that I never took them. 
Because for too many Americans, welfare is not a temporary safety net. It's a snare net. And generations get stuck inside of this. In fact, a Pew study shows that 70% of people who are currently on government assistance will never escape. And that extends to their children and their grandchildren. My escape from poverty was the same as Stevens and millions of others. We found a job. More importantly, we found dignity in work. And from there, we built our families. We became more active in our community. We volunteered. We can help millions of, millions of Americans lift them up out of poverty and bring them closer to that dignity of work. And this committee here can do three things to help drive that home. The first is stop the benefits cliff. Right now, we've created this impossible structure where families are forced with the decision of either cut back on their hours or don't take a promotion or receive additional government funding. Uh, we are stopping that, and we need, to, we need to change the benefits cliff. The second is expand tax credits for apprenticeships. The average apprenticeship starting salary is $77,000 a year. And finally, institute work requirements similar to the successful bipartisan reform that was passed in 1996, with, which lifted millions of people out of poverty. Today, I ask all of you to create a better America, an America which tells all people we need you, an America that creates limitless opportunities, an America that allows all people to pursue happiness. And that pursuit begins with the dignity of work. Thank you, Chairman LaHood. La Hood. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Davis, and all the members of this committee for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Paprocki. We'll next uh, recognize Mr. Montgomery. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Subcommittee Chairman LaHood, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify here today on the dignity of work. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Salt and Light, located in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois. The Salt and Light opened its doors in January 2004 with a focus on sharing the good news of the gospel by helping those in need through a food pantry and clothing closet. Very quickly, we grew into the largest emergency food program in our area and a leader for providing access to basic resources. As Salt and Light's reach and influence expanded, I grew disillusioned with what we were doing. Most of the situations I encountered never seemed to change and the lines only got longer. I had even begun seeing young adults standing in line who as children stood in line with their parents. The generational cycle of poverty was playing out right before my eyes. I began asking myself, were we contributing to it? It was at this time I was introduced to the book When Helping Hurts. Our small staff and board began a journey of wrestling with what it had to say and what it might mean for us to embrace its ideologies. As 2013 ended, I presented the board with a vision for what change might look like. As we moved forward, we acknowledged how much we still didn't know and how important it was to be willing to listen and learn along the way. The primary guiding principle during this time was we knew we had to stop doing for and start doing with. We recognized that by doing for individuals what they could or had the potential to do for themselves, we caused harm. The result is a unique and innovative approach for addressing chronic, chronic food insecurity and access to other basic resources where individuals can acquire what their family needs, learn practical job skills, and generate revenue to fund the programming at the same time. In our model, participants earn store credit and minimum wage by volunteering at either of our locations for up to a maximum of four hours each week. This credit can be used to purchase groceries, clothing, or other household items. Both of our locations operate a retail storefront offering secondhand items, and our Urbana location has a grocery department comparable to an Aldi in the number and types of items it carries. Inventory is purchased from a variety of vendors just like any other independent grocery store. Both stores are open to the public and are staffed by regular, full, and part-time employees and volunteers with participants working alongside. Accepted forms of payment include cash, credit, and debit cards, participant store credit. Urbana also accepts SNAP and WIC for qualifying grocery items. 100% of the net proceeds from the store support the store credit participants earn and the other programs and services we offer. The last year of the old model, we had a budget of just under $370,000 that was 100% funded through donations. 
Transitioning to a retail storefront with all the programmatic changes meant an increase in staffing to 14 employees and an almost 200% increase to the budget. But because of the revenues generated by the retail operations, we only needed to raise 6% more in donations than we had previously. This year, our operating budget is $3.6 million and is about 85% self-funded through our retail operations, with the remaining 15% coming from donations. We have 51 employees and 150 participant households who are earning store credit. I do not believe simply ensuring work requirements are fulfilled and loopholes are closed for TANF will provide the kind of transformation desired. I do believe, however, not doing so is a disservice to the people we seek to help. Reasonable and appropriate expectations based on the capacity of the individual is not punitive or onerous. It is loving and affirming. It has been said people rise or fall to the level of the expectations you have for them. To have no expectations is to communicate you do not believe they have anything to offer, anything to contribute, not only in their situation, but to the community they are a part of. I can think of nothing more diminishing and disempowering to the very spirit, the very dignity of a person. Regardless of the changes made to TANF, however, I have little faith any widespread transformation will occur in the lives of those struggling in poverty if the states are the administrators of this or any other welfare program. The one-size-fits-all approach most state and federal programs take do not allow for the kind of flexibility needed to effectively work with families whose situations and obstacles vary from one neighbor to the next, let alone from one end of the state to the other. From the federal perspective, I can understand where administration through the states may be more efficient, but clearly it has been programmatically ineffective. It is time we stop doing what is easy and start doing what is right. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Subcommittee Chairman LaHood, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify here today. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery. Next recognize Mr. Butler. Thank you, Chairman LaHood, Chairman Smith, and Ranking Member Mr. Davis, and the rest of the distinguished committee for having us here today. Uh, I'll give you a little history of Pathway Ministries. We were founded in 1955 after two ladies visited right here at the Pacific Garden Mission. They came back to Peoria and started serving coffee and donuts and sharing the gospel of Christ with men who were experiencing homelessness. The ministry now operates across seven different facilities serving nearly 2,000 individuals each year. We average more than 160 men and women staying in our facilities every night. In 2023, we served more than 100,000 meals, provided over 50,000 nights of shelter, and graduated 151 men and women from our residential programs. Those programs include varying aspects of education, counseling, life skills, and work readiness training. Our Pathway Works provides critical job readiness opportunities for our students within commercial enterprises, and our ministries of Empower Life and Barnabas Counseling serve our community by offering life-affirming assistance, parenting classes, and clinical counseling. Our mission is to create pathways out of poverty through Jesus with our neighbors in need. That mission begins with a different view of poverty than most. We don't view poverty as simply a lack of material things or even housing. We believe poverty is more complex and is the result of brokenness in the four fundamental relationships of life. Our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with creation or our work. We believe that Jesus came to restore not just our relationship with God, but to renew all four of these relationships, and we all need re renewal because at some level, we're all poor. Poverty will look different for each of us, and most of the men and women we serve are experiencing devastating effects from their brokenness in one or more of these relationships. They not only seek shelter, but a pathway to stability. And one of the most important aspects of that path will be the dignity and sustainability that work provides. I've personally experienced the value of this approach as my own pathway out of poverty includes a lifestyle of drug addiction and alcoholism, trying to be a gangster and eventually prison. But Jesus restored and renewed my relationships with himself, with myself, with others, and with my ability to work. We believe this pathway begins with com compassionate crisis care, meeting people where they're at with love and support. And that path includes two programs or avenues our guests can choose from. Our next step program focuses primarily on vocation. Our advisors assist guests as they learn to take their next step towards spiritual freedom, personal responsibility, and self-sufficiency. 
The second avenue is our renewal program, which is a residential recovery-based program. This opportunity is nine months long, is Jesus-centered, and allows students time to dig deep and focus on repairing those relationships I just spoke about. All of our programming, from crisis care to renewal, has some form of alert work included. It might be just getting up in the morning and making your bed, doing daily chores, or participating in our job readiness training programs. Finally, we also offer our students to, who graduate from our programs the option of joining our graduate society where they can live up to three years in an affordable and accountable environment. In regards to our work readiness classes and on-the-job training, we focus on the skills everyone needs to be successful. We've partnered with Caterpillar for over 25 years recycling their wood waste and teaching students those very skills. We also partner with other work readiness programs such as Illinois Central College's Workforce Certification Program to support students in finding work that they love. One of our students, TJ, uh, just completed the ICC's truck driver training program and now drives for PepsiCo and makes a really good wage. Erica also graduated from ICC and she is now employed as a second year carpenter helping to install one of the largest solar fields in Illinois. And more importantly, Erica has been reunited with her five-year-old son, Michael. Both of these former students are now living on their own, earning living wage incomes, and have a renewed sense of purpose and dignity. And there are many more like TJ and Erica, because in the past four years, we've helped more than 600 men and women find jobs, and we've assisted more than 400 men and women in securing permanent housing. We've learned that when people grasp the dignity of work and the value of providing for themselves financially, they are empowered to live lives that bring life to the Peoria community. These folks are moving from costing our community to contributing to our community. We're putting people to work who pay taxes and spend their money in Peoria. We're adding members to local churches. We're able to experience with our students that joy when they get their first paycheck. We see the freedom that comes from people paying off debt when they thought they never could. But the most rewarding time comes when we're able to see the power of God in our students to see themselves correctly and to live with the dignity that comes from work. It's not an easy path, but by working on those four fundamental relationships with Christ, we see him not only bring eternal life, but a renewed life now. We watch him provide that pathway out of poverty. Thanks again, Chairman Smith, the Hood and Ranking Member Davis, and the rest of you. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Now recognize Ms. Schofield. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Chairman LaHood, and Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee. My name is Christy Schofield, and I'm Director of Homeless and Housing for the Dream Center Peoria. But 27 years ago, I was a homeless mother sleeping in my car with my four-year-old son and my three-year-old daughter. I had run from a marriage filled with domestic violence and was suffering from a depression so deep, so dark, I was not functional as a person or a parent. I know the pain of having your children hungry, but having nothing to give them, having them cry because they're scared and not being able to make them feel safe. But God had a bigger purpose with this. And I found the very shelter and housing programs that I now direct. And it got what I needed to become self-sustaining. And I was so grateful that I have spent the last 25 years working with these programs as a director. The work that I do, the accomplishments, um, have given back the self-esteem that I lost through the homelessness. At the Dream Center, Peoria, women, children, and families are receiving life-changing services, and I am so blessed to work for an organization that gives our guests a second chance of life and works so hard to help them become self-sustaining. I am also so honored to be able to give those the gift that I was given. At DCP, I see so many broken and homeless. Even though they become homeless for a myriad of reasons, unemployment, underemployment, substance abuse, mental health, the common thread in so many cases is the lack of self-esteem and self-belief in what they can achieve. 
That self-esteem and belief can be rebuilt through accomplishment and achievement. We partner with programs such as Workforce Development, Illinois Central College, Adults Education, and more. We offer a trades program on site for those interested in culinary, auto, small engine repair, screen printing, coding, and a complete coffee program that allows students to learn the coffee world from roasting the beans, packaging, marketing, and sales. These programs give our guests an opportunity to work and with that, accomplish and achieve, thereby gaining that self-esteem and belief in themselves and lowering the chance that they will live in poverty. We also partner with the Department of Children and Family Services, our programs being an opportunity to keep families together, which is the goal to bring safety and stability to the household. One family in our programs, a single mother household, lost her children to DCFS a little over a year and a half ago. She had been unsuccessful at managing employment due to substance abuse issues, and her children were placed in foster care. She began counseling, treatment, and a workforce initiative we partner with. She has secured full-time employment and has even worked her way into shift management. These achievements have given her a greater sense of belief in herself, and she is on the path to return of her children within the next three months. It is our belief that work builds self-esteem, provides families that have struggled to sustain a better chance at long-term success. So many years of working in these programs have given me a sense of accomplishment, pride, and self-worth. I know firsthand the difference work and becoming self-sustaining makes in someone's lives. You see, 27 years ago, when I was in my car with my kids, I lowered my pride and I called my ex to beg for help, and he said to me, I told you when you left that you would have nothing. Well, 27 years later, a lot of hard work. Myself, my children, now my grandchildren, we have everything. Chairman Smith, Chairman LaHood, and Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story, my life as well, and all that the Dream Center Peoria does for our area's most vulnerable. Thank you, Ms. Schofield. We'll now recognize Mr. Caldwell. Good morning, Chairman LaHood, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Davis, and all the members of the committee. Thank you, Chairman, for giving me the time to speak before your committee regarding both my professional uh, experience and personal experience growing up within the welfare system. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. During that time, for many years, my mother was addicted to crack cocaine and our family only endured via government housing and welfare. But a government check can only do so much. In my experience, there are two kinds of people who get on government assistance. The first is those who really don't have a choice. They see government assistance as a temporary measure to help them get through a rough patch, rough patch to get back on their feet, which is how the system was originally created. But in the last 50 years, it has become a way of life for many Americans, a permanent solution. And the promise of the so-called great society became a trap for millions of Americans. In many cases, those who get on government assistance too often get comfortable and figure out how to manipulate the system as much as possible so they can continue on the same path for, pathway going forward. I've seen such thinking take down even the strongest of people. For years, my grandmother was our family's saving grace. She'd visit us in an apartment and government housing project on the south side where drugs and gangs were in every hallway. And she would come in with bags of groceries and shoes that she bought us from Payless Shoe Store. She tried to take care of us from afar. But eventually, she had seen enough, and my siblings and I had moved in with her. 
She was a no-nonsense woman of faith in the industry. Nana, as we called her, worked 10 hours a day as a private duty nurse, and we were doing okay for a while until our Nana's car was struck by a habitual drunk driver. And this woman, who worked hard her entire life, could no longer do her job. Her back brought agony with every step. She tried to work a reduced schedule and was now doing overnight shifts, harder on her life and well-being, but easier on her body. But then she couldn't even do that anymore. The government checks began to arrive again, not for my mom anymore, but for my grandmother. When you get into this dependency mentality, it changes everything. Your focus can change. Your thoughts too quickly becomes, how can I get more? More housing, more food stamps, more cash from the government. My grandmother's desire to work the system all too quickly took on a life of his own. People in my community would come around and say, listen, these are the kinds of things that I've been pulling off to get more of this or more of that. And my grandmother would lean into it. One can, one can completely lose their pride as they try to figure out how to survive by working the system. Even more tragically, you begin to pass down these tactics to your family and those around you. I got into public service volunteering for my local alderman at 14 and my first job working part-time for the Social Security Administration by 16. But there were times in my teens I was told not to work because it could jeopardize the government assistance our family was receiving. Even then, the idea was both astonishing and horrifying to me. But I don't necessarily blame my grandmother for that. Poverty and government dependence don't just affect your bank account. Eventually, it begins to affect your mind. You see nothing but what's in front of you. And when what's in front of you is a politician with another handout, watch out. How many Americans have accepted the narrative that only government handouts are the answer to all that else? Too many. More often than not, the people around me weren't simply deciding to give up. They were living in a culture of dependency that they passed down from birth. Both my grandmother and my mother gave into that culture. And they expected me to figure out the best way to live on that same track. For in, my, for in neighborhoods like the one I grew up in, there is no perceived incentive to advance. After all, the checks for housing and food stamps and other assistance arrive every month. This is why the system must be reformed. Welfare should only exist for a certain period of time, unless you're totally disabled and can't physically work. It should not last for a generation. The government should instead provide more incentives for real world training and education to recipients about a life beyond government dependence. I believe, ref I believe reforms to welfare should be approached with the same bipartisan spirit that Speaker Newt Gingrich and President Bill Clinton had during the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, a bipartisan compromise and overhaul that significantly changed our nation's welfare system to require work and exchange for time-limited assistance and supports. Its official name was the Personal Responsibility and Work, Op Work Op Opportunity Reconciliation Act. Personal Responsibility. It has been almost 20 years since we revisited and recommitted to this idea. Many will point to institutional racism or generations of poverty that have, been, that have made it tougher for many, particularly blacks in the inner cities, to succeed. Truthfully, racism has had an impact on many people. However, citing racism as the sole reason for a lack of success is merely another trap meant to keep underprivileged people dependent. People have to want the power that comes with personal responsibility. But first, they need to even know such capability and power exist. There is not one government handout that can pour into you the desire to better your own life. As Reagan, Ronald Reagan once warned, we should measure welfare success by how many people leave welfare, not by how many are added. He understood, as I do from firsthand experience, that those trapped within government assistance will eventually devalue their own lives, so much so 
that, that, that life itself would take on little meaning. Thus, the shootings and teenagers ready to murder without hesitation as easily as grabbing a bite to eat. Morally throwing more money at the problem is clearly not the answer. Until we have the courage to articulate and address the issues of personal responsibility or better parenting, schooling, accountability, then whatever welfare we pander will only make things worse. There is no, there is no doubt that our cities are crying out for help, as my family did many years ago. But we answer that, but how we answer that cry will determine a level of dependency or success for future millions of Americans. Thank you. Caldwell, um, we'll now recognize Ms. Williams as our last witness. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Chairman LaHood, and Ranking Member Davis, and all the members of the committee. My name is Sadika Williams, and I'm Senior Vice President of Reentry Services for the Safer Foundation. Thank you for providing this time and space to give testimony. It is especially appropriate given April is Second Chance Month, the time when Congress and our nation raise awareness about the successes and challenges faced by formerly incarcerated individuals in our society. During Second Chance Month, we promote policies, programs, and opportunities that support rehabilitation and reintegration for the one in three Americans who carry the lifetime burden of an arrest and conviction record. The Safer Foundation was launched in 1972 by two men of the cloth, Bernie Curran and Gus Wilhelmi, to provide non-sectarian mentoring and workforce development services to people returning to the community from jail and prison. For 52 years, Safer Foundation has provided a full spectrum of reentry workforce development and rehabilitation services for men and women, youth and adults in Iowa and Illinois. Today, we are a national leader in supporting the efforts of people with arrests and conviction records to become employed and productive members of the community. Since 1972, our work has expanded to include academic and vocational career education, community corrections and education services inside of Cook County Jail, the nation's largest single site detention center. More recently, SAFER has been the lead agency in the Innovative Supported Reentry Network Collaborative. This is a holistic, comprehensive reentry navigation model providing stable housing, substance use and mental health treatment, physical health care services, job readiness, documentation assistance, and job placement services. I want to speak a few moments to the issue of high quality living wage work. People with arrest and conviction records need high quality living wage employment opportunities to defeat recidivism. Several years ago, SAFER partnered with J.P. Morgan Chase on the J.P. Morgan Second Chance Hiring Pilot. That program connected individuals with arrest and conviction records to substantive living wage careers in the financial services sector where demand for skilled labor is high. Research su suggests that post-prison high quality, higher wage employment results in fewer arrests or returns to prison when compared to low wage, low job quality employment. The pilot's success was demonstrated by J.P. Morgan's Chase increase in the hiring of people with arrest and conviction records and contributed to the launch of the Second Chance Business Coalition, highlighting a broader shift towards inclusive employment practices within the financial industry. High quality living wage work is pro-social and improves self-esteem and is a positive use of time. Knowing your work will provide for your way of life makes a difference. That gives you self-esteem and confidence. High quality living wage work through reentry is critical to the success of the nation's economy. People with arrest and conviction records are one of the largest untapped pools of labor available to U.S. businesses. The current demand for qualified workers is high, and according to the National Federation of Independent Businesses, many unemployed individuals do not meet the qualifications for industries that are hiring. 55% of business owners reported hiring or trying to hire. 89% of those hiring or trying to hire reported few or no qualified applicants for available positions. 
What can Congress do? We urge the Congress to fund $135 million for the Reentry Employment Opportunities, RIO, program at the Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration, which provides workforce development and reentry services to people with criminal legal histories, while helping employers identify trained and credentialed employees to hire for their open positions. We urge that Congress to fund $125 million for the Second Chance Act program at the Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance to provide reentry services and supports nationwide. Finally, we urge that Congress create new legislation that removes the more than 44,000 state and federal legal collateral consequences, creating lifetime barriers that impede the social development of individuals and their families from the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. When we make nominal investments in people's efforts to secure private sector employment through reentry, the beneficiaries include all of us, taxpayers, government, families, and communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for your valuable uh, and substantive testimony here today. We're now going to move to our question and answer period from the members of Congress. We'll begin with Chairman Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank each and every one of you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Caldwell, your story is one of victory over adversity. Um, your experience has surely, it surely has taught you valuable lessons about, about what does help individuals um, escape poverty, including the value of work and the positive, positive, positive ripple effects it can have in our communities. Um, that being said, could you share some insight into what policies, in your view, um, a, create a direct impediment um, in lifting more Americans out of poverty? Yeah, there's uh, a number of things that I think uh, does block that. And I got to tell you, with the Welfare Reform Act of 96, which I thought was incredibly important because it did allow for individuals like myself, for example, I work for the Social Security Administration. I only could get that part-time job based on experience and the fact that I was receiving or my family was receiving benefits at the time. That was a, a, a gate that opened wide open for many, many Americans, I think. Now, the truth of the matter is, for those who want to reform the system, which is a good thing, those who want to say, if you uh, earn you know, a particular dollar amount, we're going to pull the rug from under you, and we're going to ensure that the door closes uh, right behind you. I think that's where the problem comes for a lot of folks in communities like the South Side of Chicago. They want to uh, certainly know that there's certainty and the fact that they can go out and work and earn as much as they possibly can and then gradually come off the system. And I think that in and of itself is an opportunity for those who may be a little fearful of going out there. That gives them a, a bit of peace to, to try to get that dignity of work and lift out of poverty. Um, I noticed that uh, when you were giving your testimony, you had it looked like maybe not hit all the points that you want. Is there anything additional that you would like to share? No, I, you know, I think for many of us, it's become the boogeyman that you say someone has to work to earn benefits or rather be able to have benefits. I think that's a boogeyman. I think it's wrong. I think for a lot of individuals, they want to work. People in the communities that I grew up in, they wanted to work. They didn't know the processes in some ways, and then some others just rather stayed home. But when you stay home, Things like depression happen, you have domestic abuse that could happen, and then there's criminality that can come right after, nefarious activities to try to earn money and continue to receive your welfare at the same time. And I think that, those are some of the issues that need to be closely looked at. Thank you. Mr. Montgomery, um, I appreciate the unique approach that your organization takes in providing the assistance through, through real-world experiences that that empower individuals and demonstrate the importance of, of work and independence. Um, based on your experience and the, the transformation you've seen in those you've, you've assisted, how might state and federal level welfare programs do more to provide that sense of empowerment to folks? Oh, there we go. 
get it eventually. Thank you, Chairman Smith. Uh, you know, I, I think that one thing that I've heard mentioned is the, the benefit cliff. Uh, certainly, I think that is a huge obstacle for a lot of folks in trying to move forward. I don't know how many different people I've spoken with who reached that point of decision where, okay, now if I'm going to move forward, my benefits are going to be cut, but the wages I'm going to earn are not going to make up the difference. So now I can either choose to retreat or I can choose to persevere. And the reality of it is, especially when you've grown up in a generational cycle of poverty where all you have known and been conditioned to is the idea of standing in line, the ability to see down the road is almost impossible. And so I think that certainly is, is, a, is a huge part of really being able to implement programs that work with folks because at the end of the day, the people have to have the autonomy and capacity to make those decisions to really move forward uh, as a part of that. That's the bottom line for us is we acknowledge that, that all of us are broken and we want to walk alongside one another as we all grow in, 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 into who it is we've been created to be. But we have to create space and opportunity for that to happen over time. Thank you. Thank you all for, for being here. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. We'll now yield to Mr. Davis for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of the witnesses. I certainly would agree that work is one of the best programs that could exist to reduce poverty. As a matter of fact, I'm reminded that the prophet Gabran said that when you work, it is love made visible, that when you work, it binds you to your dreams, hopes, and aspirations. Vice President Williams, let me thank you for spending time with us. And I know that SAFER has refined its programs over time, and that oftentimes you've had to adjust and readjust can you talk a bit about what supports you've found necessary to help your clients overcome barriers to long-term work, productive work that they enjoy and can feel good about? Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Davis. Um, we have been, and our mission remains the same when it comes to providing work um, for the individuals we serve. But over time, we realize that people want to work, but they have so many barriers in between them and that job. And they could be collateral consequences, so statutory legal barriers that stand before them. And I, I have to tell you, I've done a lot of work in advocacy, and it's like we're whipping off layers to an onion in terms of how many barriers exist in front of them. But also, it's the supports they need. from wrap, They need wraparound services. So over time, we've had to become a wraparound holistic service shop, a one-stop shop, because they need housing. They need transportation in order to get to work. They have to have education in order to have skills for certain training so that they can get that living wage employment. Um, they, when they are stabilized, when they do receive housing, when they can go to a job, then they can start opening up about other issues that impact their life, including if they have any kind of substance use or mental health needs, behavioral health needs that we can treat. And now, now we're at a point where we can start talking to them about their health because we had to start to stabilize them to get to them to a point of thriving, to talk about their health. And so I'm very honored that now we have the opportunity to talk about how can we improve your health so that you can go to job to your job so that you can not only get it but maintain it I know that you've had great success in the health arena could you talk a little bit about how that came about and who you worked with well we worked with you and I many many things that we could make that happen because if it had not been for you to call the forum with healthcare employers 
I don't know if we would have been able to do the work. We had to have a formal revited health care employers, including uh, FQHCs and hospital systems and all the chairmen and all the CEOs, and they came because of your help. And they gave us an audience to listen. We had Johns Hopkins Hospital come and talk about their program, hiring people with records, where they had been hiring people with records for over a decade and had very low turnover, um, high retention, and they had close to no levels of like violent incidents that happened when they hired people with records. The, the Chicago area employers heard it. And by the end of that pilot, we had healthcare employers knocking at our door. We need to hire everybody. We need to hire, you know, we have frontline, we have nursing, we have all these positions available. But what we found in that forum is that employers had this perception that they couldn't, per the law, hire people with records. And they, they didn't know how. So they had a whole process, background check policies that were outdated. They hadn't looked at the recent law. They didn't have them updated. They didn't know how to hire. And then there was the implicit bias that was attached as well, not for the executive leadership that came to the forum, but from their hiring managers, who, if they were informed that a person had a record, they would not hire that person. So we had to navigate through all of those barriers, and we had to change the law as well. We, we led occupational licensing reform. I see Matt from the Illinois Policy Institute there. We worked with the Illinois Policy Institute, and we created a bipartisan coalition to pass occupational licensing reform. The healthcare work is the reason why we did that, because we knew if we wanted people to get into healthcare, we had to knock down those barriers and, and ensure that it was a fair process for them to have a fair chance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, I'll now recognize myself for uh, a number of questions. I, I first want to just point out, uh, today we have about 7 million unfilled jobs in the country. Uh, and everywhere that I travel in my district, and I think probably my colleagues feel the same way, it's, it's finding qualified workers, uh, truck drivers, nurses, mechanics, machinists. Uh, throughout our society, we are looking for qualified workforce. And there's, uh, again, no better topic than we're talking about today in transitioning people into the workforce to get a number of these good paying jobs through apprenticeships, skills training, and workforce development. Um, Mr. Paprocki, I want to start with you. We've heard a lot today about the bipartisan nature going back to 1996 when Speaker Newt Gingrich and President Clinton worked together on bipartisan welfare reform and the benefits. As a result of those reforms, under TANF, the Temporary Assistance of Needy Families, caseloads dropped by 80% between 1994 and 2023. Over time, these successes, though, have been chipped away by policies at the state level that gut or eliminate work requirements under the guise of compassion. While characterizing these efforts to link welfare benefits, some people have called that mean or unfair. I'm wondering if you could comment on um, linking welfare benefits to the expectation of work um, as being mean or unfair in some way, and instead of reducing these requirements, do you think it would be good to expand them to other federal means-tested programs? You know what I think is mean? Uh, how we treat poor people in this country. Uh, we treat them like they're liabilities and they're not assets, right? We, they, they're raising their hand and they say, they're saying, I want help, right? But instead, we go give them a little bit of money on a plastic card and we tell them to go away. That's mean, right? We tell them that their jobs don't have purpose, that just because it's low wage, meaning it's low value. And we whisper these little lies inside of it as if, as if dignity is commensurate with pay. It is not, right? Jobs have value, humans have value, poor people have value, and they are some of the greatest assets we have in this country. I think a great example of this uh, is, is this woman, Claudia Perez. She's over in the Pilsen neighborhood, uh, and every morning she gets up and she sells tamales to her, to her neighbors and her community. But pushing a food cart was illegal in the city of Chicago. So government officials came by, they took her food cart, they dumped out all of her food, they stomped it on the ground, and they said, this is garbage. Right. To me, that's mean. And I think we need to restore this idea of all work has dignity, and we need to promote this, and we need to shift the, the framework that we have on poor people in this country. Instead of treating them li like liabilities, we should have work requirements. We should say, we know what value that you can provide for this country, because we believe in you. And we should expand more of that and allow more people to see that dignity in their work. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Butler, um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. And thanks for sharing your story uh, of success and, and how you achieved that. You, you talked about um, the Pathway organization on the success you've had building the capacity and the skill sets for your residents through work uh, so that they can earn higher wages. Can you talk about uh, the specific partnerships that you have in Peoria, specifically with Illinois Central College and the workforce and certificate programs that they offer? Yeah, sure. So we partner with Illinois Central College and we have, first I'd like to just say that the folks coming through our door uh, need a moment to breathe and to become stable. I'm sure with Pacific Garden Mission and Dream Center and, and everywhere else in our community, folks come in and they need a moment to, to breathe, uh, to be stabilized and to get ready. To, we use an asset-based approach at Pathway Ministries when folks come into our doors. Uh, what is it that they want to do? And when they've expressed interest to further their education, to further job readiness training, to, to get out of this cycle of poverty, not to get my SSI check because I can make way more, which is a mindset that just blows me away that people come in for $735 a month and don't want a job making $2,000 a month. They're afraid to lose that check. It's, it's, it's an anomaly. It's just it's awful to deal with. But we partner with ICC. Uh, our folks are able to get funded through ICC. That's free to them to go to school. They actually will earn a stipend to go to school and learn that trade. It's, it's been absolutely awesome uh, throughout our community as well. Our Pathway Works Enterprise programs, uh, we also pay folks a stipend as they stay in the shelter or they're in our renewal programs to learn those soft skills, what employers are looking for. But being dependable, coming to work with a good attitude, how to, how to have conflict resolution so that they can further their lives uh, outside of Pathway Ministries. Homelessness is typically just a symptom of the real problem. And when we address homelessness as an individual, rather than this great big problem, we can have more excess, success at, at solving the problem when we do it on an individual level. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Schofield, I'm going to ask you the same question. I also want to just acknowledge um, you sharing your story and the struggles you've gone through um, and what you've been able to do to better your life. Thank you for sharing that here today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Dream Center um, and the similar partnerships you have with workforce agencies and the community college? We would not be able to do what we do with people without the great partnerships in our community. Um, we are partnered with Illinois Central College on the same types of programs as Pathways. We are pro, um, partnered with Dole Education, um, with several trade schools, the um, apprenticeship program uh, through the electrical, that's what it is, it's the apprenticeship program. All those programs we partner with because we found that so few people actually want to go back and get a degree. They wanted to get something that they could start working right now. And these programs would offer stipends while they were training so they could afford to live and be a part of the program and learn a new trade. And these people have been very, very successful. Um, and so it's been a great program for us. Thank you for that. Um, well, next, Mr. Right. Uh, Smucker of Pennsylvania for his questions. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate each of you being here, share your stories, and share uh, the way you're meeting the needs in your communities. It's really inspiring. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity f for us on a bipartisan basis to be discussing these. And I think this is most helpful uh, when, we, when we look together at what's working and what's not and, and do not have the partisan bickering that I think is, is not, helpful, uh, not helpful at all. I want to start with um, reconciling a few statements that were made today. And I, I've got a great deal of respect for Ranking Member Davis, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick out just one statement he made. He said he strongly disagrees with those who blame people for their poverty. He strongly disagrees with those who blame people for their poverty. Mr. Montgomery, you said people rise or fall to the level of expectations you have of them. And Ms. Schofield, you said a common thread in so many cases is the lack of self-esteem or belief. And I'd like to ask, maybe we'll start with Mr. Montgomery. How do you reconcile the idea, we know individuals you're serving um, have things stacked against them. 
Uh, they may not have the family support that's needed. They may have generational poverty. Uh, they may not know how, uh, Mr. Codwell, you said, uh, to get off of government assistance, how to enter the workforce. Uh, they may have been incarcerated. Uh, they, may, they may be drugs. There are a lot of things. They may have a poor education system. There are a lot of things stacked against them. But yet we have to expect that they somehow rise to the level of accepting responsibility for their own path forward. And so I think, you know, saying we strongly disagree with those who blame people for their poverty may not fully capture how we need to think about this. I heard another member of the Ways and Means Committee uh, at one of our hearings say a statement that shocked me, and that was that we were holding that hearing that day to dispel the notion, she was glad we were holding the hearing because it dispelled the notion that many members had that work ethic has anything to do with success or failure. And so, uh, and this was a teacher who talked about uh, the classroom where students were coming with very, you know, things stacked against them. But what a, I just thought, what a sad thing to think that we would be telling people that you can't pull yourself up because of the condition you're in. So, Mr. Montgomery, how do you how do you balance that? How do you how do you get to the point that Mr. Caldwell was talking about, where you can you can uh, change your own life? Come. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, poverty is complex, right? We, we know that there are systems at play, and we know that there are choices at play. In my experience, everyone's situation and position in life boils down to two things, opportunity and choices. The opportunity often, uh, systems are involved in that, where I'm born, the color of my skin, the, the type of education I'm in for, afforded, the opportunities that are in front of me, right? Everyone, it's different. With that, we all have choices to make. You know, in my experience, certainly the less opportunity you have, the less margin you have to make bad choices. For sure, no doubt. But it does not remove the personal responsibility of making choices. And so I think that the idea that it is somehow punitive or and otherwise blaming the individuals, it's a matter of perspective. I think that was something we encountered when we first changed our model. There were folks who looked at what we were doing, and quite frankly, a few referred to it as the Republican model, uh, which is somewhat fitting today given the conversation. But, but the reality was we, weren't, we were not changing how we were doing what we were doing in order to punish uh, or blame those individuals. We were changing our model because we believed in them. We believed in their capacity. We believed that they had something more to offer than what they were experiencing <laughs> in this poverty situation that they were dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's important how we look at it. Certainly, if you approach it, you can approach it from a punitive perspective and how you basically administer or Im implement those sorts of things. But for us, that's not how we look at it at all. We need, as a society, their, their uh, energy, their, in, their, uh, their, their work. 110%. Uh, and, we talk about that every day, that yeah. we are co-laborers. And what that means is that I have as much to gain from you as you do from me in this relationship as we work alongside one another. One of the things that strikes me, and I only have a few seconds here, is that most of your programs, you're doing it without any government assistance. And in fact, Mr. Caldwell said the government programs we have perhaps make it worse. Yeah, no <laughs> which zero is, government which assistance. Is, which is amazing <laughs> to hear. Uh, but one, one thing we can all agree on, I think everyone here and everyone there, is the value of work. So perhaps we ought to be thinking about our government programs uh, and, th and, and investing more in that career and technical training. Uh, th there's a program called WIOA. I have a bill that would re-energize that program, incentivize employees to, to help in individuals get to the workforce. Uh, also, we could potentially be providing a tax credit to employers who invest in apprenticeship programs, who, who uh, invest in career technical training. Uh, having those kind of connections, because as Chairman LaHood said, millions of jobs available, yet millions of people not participating in the workforce. And I think we ought to be focusing our efforts on how we can better connect those two facts of life that we have uh, here today. So this was very, very helpful. Sorry I'm a little bit over time here, Mr. Chairman, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schmucker. Now recognize Ms. Moore of Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Ranking Member. I want to thank all of our witnesses for very profound, insightful uh, testimony. Um, I am, really appreciate my colleagues for being so candid um, about their beliefs, and so I may as well be candid 
as well. Uh, I do think that when we start talking about blaming people um, for their poverty, I kind of agree with you, Mr. Montgomery. People have opportunity and choices as well. And I thought that was very profound the way you put it. But I would say that there are economic schemes that maximize profit over people. And that that's what traps people into low wage work. So when we start hearing about Ms. Williams and the type of opportunity she's talking about and the kind of opportunities that my colleagues here often talk about, you often want to talk about forcing people to go to work saying that you, know, you can't eat dignity. You can't pay your rent with dignity. You need money. You need enough money, um, and I would think that these low-wage uh, jobs uh, uh, create problems. I agree with you, Mr. Paprocki, that benefit cliffs really continue to keep people subjected to these low-wage uh, jobs, uh, forces them to, to remain in them if they want to continue to get Medicaid and other kinds of support. L welfare deliberately deliberately limits the education and training that you can get so that you can never get out of poverty. Uh, and of course, poor health uh, is a major barrier uh, in mental health. And domestic violence, Ms. Schofield, is a huge risk factor for being poor. Uh, Mr. Paparaki, you didn't mention what your level of education was at the time your mother uh, was sick and whether or not you had any children. Would you share that with the committee? I did not have children. I had a bachelor's degree. And you have a bachelor's degree. So That's you right. didn't have a lot of barriers you would, to get yourself together when your mother died. I mean, you were a good white man in America with no kids. You didn't need child care. Thank you for that. Well, I, Tesla, I, you had a bachelor's I did, degree. So I don't have much time. Mr. Uh, Montgomery, I am so happy that you are engaged in finding the root causes of poverty, that you're more dative uh, driven, uh, and you've really demonstrated it by your uh, amazing testimony here today. Mr. Butler, you're a sermon in shoes. I thought you were going to pass the collection plate there for a minute. You're a role model. I really love your analysis about building the kinds of spiritual and human uh, uh, cultural relationships. Um, and again, Ms. Schofield, um, really, your happily ever after wasn't but it turned out happily ever after anyway for you. Domestic violence is a real risk factor for women. You have a baby and you think things are gonna work out and when they don't, it's the woman who becomes the welfare queen and the problem and not the man. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, well, I hope you go and kiss your grandmother 20 times on her feet everywhere uh, for um, raising you, any assistance that she got from anybody, she deserved it, and it looks like you turned out pretty good. Um, Ms. Williams, I do have a number of questions for you. You talk a lot about the quality of jobs that people get as delivering them from poverty, and not just this notion, you know, some of these oxymorons that we hear. Um, let me just, a couple of them I think I kind of wrote down. Yeah, giving people assistance locks people in poverty. I mean, you know, that's an oxymoron. You helping somebody and that's what locks them into poverty. Um, I just want you to comment a little bit um, uh, on particular one program that the ranking member didn't mention, the Health Profession and Opportunity Grant, which the Republicans on this committee refused to reauthorize, which would have provided I still got time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. No, no, oh, okay. Reclaiming my time. Um, the, you know, they refuse to renew it. But given the fact that there are 65,000 people turning 65 every single day, wouldn't it have been helpful to develop stackable kinds of credentials with people in the healthcare industry, considering that all of these people here, except for me, are getting old every day? I would yield to you for your answer. I would say that it would not only benefit the individuals that would participate in the credentialing and program, it would help the employers that desperately need the workers. Poor people don't just want to be stable, they want to thrive like everyone else. So that means that we have to provide living wage employment and credentialing opportunities to get them trained for the skills that they need. Healthy people equals healthy communities, and everyone will benefit from that. So I just wanted to say, when we, we you know, I want to thank the members of this subcommittee and 
Ranking Member Davis for supporting programs like uh, Rio and Second Chance Program because I would say that they have done an immense service to our participants to get them out of poverty. When we look at Medicaid, when we look at insurance, when we look at food uh, benefits, that is crisis stabilization. That is getting them on a footing so we can even talk about a job. Because if we can't get those things, if we can't get them into housing if there's a need, because there's domestic violence, then we can't talk to them about work. We can't talk to them about training because they're worried about how they're going to eat. They're worried about how they're going to live. So we have to address those things first before we can even talk about a job before we can even and we have to talk about transportation that's one thing I haven't heard anybody talk about how they're gonna get to the job we have situations where we like we have a job but people are like it is so expensive on your bus card to get to the job so it's like by the time they get done with their transportation costs it's not even worth getting to the job because it's too expensive so we need employers that are near the individual. Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. I'm going to next recognize Mr. Kerry. Before I do that, I do want Mr. Paprocki, you were asked a question. If you could just respond quickly. Mr. Chairman, was that, was that my time? Well, that's, that's one reason why I was really happy about your indulgence because you know, when your point of view is on the table, then you get, the, the clock doesn't even move. And so he responded to my question adequate to my satisfaction. He answered it. So uh, thank you, Ms. Moore. Uh, and, and we, you know, the witnesses have had time to give their testimony. Thank you. And of course, you're the chairman, so you can have as much time as you might consume yeah. well, until our planes leave. Thank you, Ms. Moore, for that. Um, I, Mr. Paprocki, if you could respond quickly. Well, to... Ms. Moore, first let me say, uh, as a young man who's from... Do I from... get a chance to respond to whatever so he says? So we're going to let Mr. Paprocki respond. Go who's ahead. from uh, Wisconsin. Thank you for your service. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, you know, it was a struggle. The truth is I didn't make any money for eight months. Uh, when I came home here to Chicago, uh, my power had been cut off because I couldn't pay my electricity bill. I, uh, I opened the door. I tried to turn on the light. It didn't flip and I smelled the rotting food uh, that was coming out of my refrigerator. So I understand what it's like not to have food. I went to go try to ride on the, the bus. I didn't have $2 to go take a train ride in the city of Chicago. And I sat there and I begged, right? And I begged for money and I begged for help to try to get that, to get that step. My point is not to say that the, str the struggle doesn't exist. I fully understand it and I've, I've lived a part of that struggle. But what I've also seen not only through the data, but through life experience, is that work can pull people up. And it can, we can tell individuals that what you do matters. And that's intrinsically what's happening in work. It's, it's a conversation It's saying, I need you. Right, right now, you're sitting here in front of me because we need you. Right? And that's what I want to tell more of the people in our society is that your work matters. It has value and we need you. Thank, Thank you. Their, their work matters, but they, they need enough money. And it's like I, I just repeat what I said. You didn't have any barriers. You didn't have children to take care of. You didn't need daycare. You're a white man in America. Okay. You are articulate beyond comparison to 90% of the population. Thank you, Mr. And I congratulate you for pulling yourself out of that situation under those circumstances, and I yield back. Uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Kerry of Ohio. Uh, I want to thank the chairman. I also want to thank the ranking member Davis, and um, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, I had an opportunity to look at all of your bios because the flight from Washington, D.C. to here was took less time than the cab ride from O'Hara <laughs> here. So I was able to read most of your testimony. And, and, uh, and Matthew, because I cannot read your name from here, uh, but I'm going to call you Matt. Matthew, Matthew. Um, I, you know, both you and Ms. Williams laid out some very, very, you, you laid out three things. And I always ask any person that comes into my office, give me the three things that we can do in Congress. So. Matthew, I'm going to start with you. Ms. Williams, I'm going to go to you next. Expand upon those three things. Keep it within 40 seconds if you can because I only have four minutes. Matthew, you're up. Uh, for the first, we've talked about benefits cliffs and the problems of incentives, is that for a lot of Americans, they have to decide 
should I take this promotion? And we hear this all the time. I have a woman, Ahi, uh, who works at IC Stars, said, I have a lot of friends I know from back uh, when I was poor. They won't go for bigger jobs. That's right. They purposely go for minimum wage jobs because Section 8 is on the line, food staffs are on the line, and insurance are on the line. Okay, we need go, to fix it. Go to the next. The second one is uh, uh, about expanding apprenticeship opportunities. Absolutely. Look, there is a great way to lift people up. This same woman, Ahi, learned coding from one of our friends, IC Stars. Her first job was $56,000 a year. She immediately got promoted to $87,000 in a year. Now she's an entrepreneur making more money than that. She was homeless with three children, and she was able to pull herself out. And, and to that end, uh, you have a um, my colleague from the other side of the aisle, uh, Nikki Batinsky, who's here in Illinois, dear friend of mine. We have co-introduced the LEAP Act uh, together, which is an apprenticeship program. So if you haven't taken a look at it, please do. Uh, I think it's a good bipartisan measure that can move forward. Go to your number third. Uh, the third is his work requirements, similar to what we saw uh, in the year 1996. Uh, right. That was just for TANF. I think yep. there's a huge opportunity for this committee to expand it beyond that. I do want to say a quick quote from a senator. Make who it the, quick. It said, the culture of welfare must be I replaced by Williams. the culture of work. The culture of dependence must be replaced by a culture of okay. self-sufficiency. That came uh, from our current president, Joe Biden. Okay, good deal. All right, Ms. Williams, give me those three things real quick. I wrote them down quickly. I really like the uh, uh, 40, what, well, you just go. G give, me, give me one, two, three, give it in 40 seconds, please. All right, thank you so much. Um, I would say first, continue to support um, uh, grants or opportunities like the Health Opportunity Grant. Uh, and tell me why. Because we saw, because we serve all industries, right? Yeah. So a, a lot of them. Healthcare was one of the top performing where the retention uh, uh, numbers were very high. Mm -hmm. um, because when people have a real opportunity as a frontline position, there is an opportunity for growth to be promoted within the institution. And the hospitals do, they have massive problems with frontline gotcha. staff. Gotcha. So they yep. want to Absolutely. promote people. Okay, go to um, number two. But also Rio, as well as Second Chance Act, because we are seeing the same kind of results in those industries as well. Um, I would say the second thing is uh, legislation for collateral consequences. I mentioned before how we work with Illinois Policy Institute yep. in a bipartisan coalition within the House and the Senate in Illinois because everyone understood all these statutory barriers that are in fact that make no sense. It's the industries that were pushing them just to exclude, you know, have exclusive markets. Okay. But the person, you know, doesn't have an opportunity. There are real barriers to just stopping people from going into living wage opportunities where they can make a career, not a job. I um, got to you. Lift give, them out. give me your last one. And the third one is care coordination, support for care coordination services. Tell me about that real quick. So, give, me, give me about 20 seconds, okay? People want to work, but they have problems navigating all the various systems. And the systems, mm -hmm. none of them are speaking to themselves, to each other. The, the training, the job, the workforce development, housing, uh, health care, behavioral health, none of the systems are talking to each other. None of the, the correctional systems in, in terms of Illinois Department of Corrections or any other state agencies, no one is kind of doing this care coordination where you have one person who's doing um, the, the navigation gotcha. to a person. So it's a coordination issue. And I, I appreciate that. Bringing report. all the resources Bring together everybody. to get the best return on investment. And I would, I would encourage my colleagues, since we're all going to take that two-hour drive to the airport today to read through your testimony. It was very in insightful. Mr. Caldwell, yes. I'm not sure everything that you're doing right now, but when you do decide to run for office, and I don't care what side of the aisle it is, I'll be knocking on doors for you. Uh, All right. Uh, thank you so much. Ms. Schofield, I, I will tell you this is the story about you living in the car, inspirational, really happy. Where are your children today? You've got like three seconds. I'm sorry. Center, my daughter works for OSF. I'm sure you're very proud. I, I want to thank you all. I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member. And uh, again, thank you all for coming out today. Thanks so much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Now recognize Mr. Hearn of Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony today. And uh, this, this meeting today, this hearing, is the very reason I'm in Congress today. I spent 35 years creating jobs uh, from entry level to executive level for across all kinds of businesses. Quite frankly, 35 years as a McDonald's franchisee, as a person who went through career tech, Botech when I was in high school. But more importantly, it's the foundation of journey of life. A person who grew up in extraordinary poverty. Um, my stepdad was the first generation welfare recipient. He figured out how to work the system. My mother had been married to an Air Force guy, my dad, and uh, they got divorced after he went to Vietnam for the third time. And she ended up having three more kids uh, with the two that she had, my brother and I, with my dad. 
But he figured out how to go get checks from the mailbox. And every program out there you can think of, I, I've looked at these, I've seen them. I can tell you that the only reason I'm at where I'm at today is not, the welfare fed us. It kept our lights on. We had no running water, no indoor plumbing until I was in the eighth grade. And I can tell you right now, the thing that's really nice about America is we try to take care of our people. Because when you don't care about your people, you don't care as a nation. And you know, it's, it's sad that this issue in America is partisan at all. It should be bipartisan. We should all agree that every person should deserve a job and the opportunity to work. I, I'm, not, I'm not politicizing this. This is a fact. But I can also tell you, Ms. Schofield, Ms. Williams, it's different for a mom with a child than it is a single guy that can just go. And I saw this because my mother found out that her, her husband, my stepdad, had three other kids per three other wives, nine other kids. And he had figured out how to get all kinds of checks. So he had figured out the system. And his parents were hardworking individuals. It was, I can still remember my mother telling me to go take stuff back because food stamps wouldn't pay for it. I was the oldest of five kids. So I, I promised myself when I went to Congress, when I ran for office, never ran for anything else before, that I was going to go work to do my best to protect the opportunities that gave a guy like me that came from absolutely nothing to succeed in life. And I will never take that back. Nobody can ever, you can be critical all you want to from a political standpoint, but you just don't know. And every one of you up there have a story, and you've been telling your story, and it's very important. But as we look, as we go forward here, we've got to figure out the programs that really work. What Congress is really good about is stacking programs on programs without ever understanding whether they work or not. Last year when I was on this subcommittee, I'm not on the subcommittee anymore, but it's a passion of mine, that's why I'm here. Today's my 30th anniversary and I'm here because this is really important to me. And I can tell you right now that we have almost 90 programs. We pay out over a trillion dollars a year. The last, last number I saw was 1.2 trillion a year, federally supported programs. And the Government Accountability Office can't tell us which programs really work or not. So we're up here talking about adding other programs. What we should do is our Accountability Office should tell us what's working and what's not, and we should redeploy those dollars, not new dollars, but those dollars to programs that actually work, modernize our assistance today. Because we should be helping those who had a bad spot in life. We're blessed to be the wealthiest nation in the world. We need to act like that. We need to make sure our people rise of poverty. And yes, there's a narrative out there that the, the least of us is better than the, you know, the best of the rest of the world. So what? So what? The reason we do what we do and we go protect democracy around the world so people can have the opportunities that we have in the United States of America. So I just want to say, I want to thank you again for each of you being here. Um, I'm not asking, I mean, you guys have done a phenomenal job, but Ms. Schofield, I, I do, I've got all kinds of questions here for everybody, but I really want to just go to you because your story is pretty powerful. And I'd like for you to tell us more about the Dream Center, about what you do for people that had the, the hardships you have, because th those are really, really hardships are, because there's really binary choices. You let your kids go somewhere else, which is really hard as a mom, or you figure out how to take care of them. We work very hard at the Dream Center at creating self-sustaining families. So we bring families in and we spend a lot of time assessing them. You know, what do they want to do? Trade, school, you know, finding the best fit for that family. Um, a lot of time in homeless services there is just a quick fix. Let's throw somebody in an apartment. We want to spend time with people to find out what will keep their family above water. What can, will can, I, can I get the last two seconds, one second of my time to say to all of you all, I think that you all would agree and you've all said this and I think everybody on this panel hopefully would agree, is we have got to solve this issue that benefits Cliff once and for all across all of these programs so that people have the ability to work themselves out of this support. That's the only way it's going to work, because at the end of the day, people are smart. If I can make more money not working and provide more for my family not working, why wouldn't I do that? And shame on us as United States Congress for allowing that to happen. That's what we need to be working. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. Thanks for spending your 30th anniversary with us. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Uh, with that, I recognize Mr. Panetta, California.
Thank you. You better be thanking his wife, <laughs> not just him. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Davis. And of course, thanks to the Pacific Garden Mission for hosting us. And yes, thank you to all of our witnesses who are here today and who are willing to share their personal and professional background and uh, what they hope for the future. So thanks to all of you. Again, I'm Jimmy Panetta. I'm, I represent the 19th Congressional District out in California. Uh, it's not Chicago. Uh, it's not Milwaukee. It's not <laughs> Oklahoma. Um, it's the coast of California, okay? It's my district stretches from South San Jose, Santa Cruz, Monterey, Big Sur, all the way down to Northern San Luis Obispo. Very proud of that district, exactly. Now. It's diverse. As dynamic as it is, it's still pretty diverse, especially with this communities of interest. But I can tell you the one thing that really brings my district together is affordability or the lack of affordability and the lack of affordable housing, the cost of owning, the cost of renting, the cost of living. And yes, that does lead to homelessness, clearly. We're seeing that from Silicon Valley to the wine country of northern San Luis Obispo. That's the number one issue. Now, some of the things that we are doing to address that, especially in South San Jose, is sort of the one project, a couple of them that are around South San Jose, uh, because like I said, like you can imagine, South San Jose does have the resources to create these types of things that federal government is helping them out with as well, are these emergency interim housing sites. Places where individuals can get their own room, their own bathroom, which can lead to privacy, safety, and ultimately dignity, and ultimately stability upon which they can have the training necessary to not just get off the street, but to get back on their feet. And so I'd like to ask Ms. Williams if in her line of work, seeing this type of emergency housing, the sort of interim housing prior to permanent housing, prior to the training, what are the benefits of that? Thank you so much. Um, we have seen firsthand the importance of having emergency housing um, through the work we're doing with the support of Reentry Network Collaborative. We were actually um, asked by the state to step in during COVID-19 because people were getting released early and they had nowhere to live um, among all the other needs that they had. And so in those situations, we, I, I mean, I remember times when I was on the phone and I having to stop at a gas station to try to use my credit card to get people into housing. We had a woman right during Christmas when all the homeless shelters had shut down. She came in our office. She had a four-day-old child and her four-year-old, and she had nowhere to go. We couldn't get her into a shelter anywhere, and no one could live with that we that she would be in her car. She was running from a domestic violence situation. She had actually went to a baby shower and started going into to labor. And, and so situations like that show you have to have emergency housing as part of your housing solution so that you can provide that, that temporary support and, that will lead to permanent housing. And kind of moving forward, how can that emergency interim housing lead to what we all want for people in that position, permanent housing? Well, having that immediate solution will help stabilize that individual, right, so that they can make sure that they have what they need. Because we don't just provide that temporary housing. We also give them any kind of furnishings they need. We give them toiletries. Um, in that case, for this young woman, we made sure she had formula for her child and any other services that she needed. But it got her in a mental state of mind where she was ready to hear us, right? Because we, the way we work in terms of empowerment is we work down, we, we sit down with them, we ask them what their interests are and what their goals are, and together we work out a service plan assessing their needs and help come up with goals for them to achieve. And so housing, you have subsidized funding through, through the government, we're able to get them into housing six months and then it could be longer, which will help them. Our goal is to move them to private pay, but we have to subsidize it up front sometimes to help them get stable so that they can get the job so that they can then transition. Okay, great. Look, I, I think in my time of leaning into, um, because I do think this is an all hands on deck issue, especially when it comes to homelessness or the unhoused, whatever you want to call it, we all know the issue. Um, and I think that there, I think what we can all acknowledge is that yes, we understand work ethic. I'm an Italian American, I come from a family of immigrants. I appreciate people who work hard and what that provides them. But I just don't think there's a silver bullet to solving this issue. And I think one of the issues that we failed to address in this hearing is the mental health aspect. Because I think all of your programs are very beneficial. 
But the problem is that when you have people who have mental health issues, unfortunately it takes more than just hard work. It takes more than housing. And I think that's something that we really need to lean into a little bit more at this level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield it back. Thank you, Mr. Panetta. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. For the record, just to prove that I'm not a really bad guy, I just had 30 pink roses delivered to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good job, Mr. Hurst. <laughs> good job. Uh, we'll next recognize uh, Mr. Moore of Utah. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member, um, for hosting us in your great state and, and for, for doing this here um, at this really important um, place. Uh, every one of your testimonies to all the witnesses, every one of your statements just brings an am amount of um, personal experience that is uh, that's amazing. It's unprecedented. It's, it's, it's so important and valuable. But your experience in helping solve some of these problems and outlining solutions is, is even more important than what you've personally gone through. Um, but also, I'd like to just take a quick second to just say, to express my appreciation to those of you that are in the audience um, for living a Christ-like example to working day in and day out. I know many of you may work at this facility and in other areas. Um, thank you for your, for your work to provide for those that are the most vulnerable, uh, the poor and needy. I, I, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the, the work that, that they do is one of the proudest aspects that I have of my faith and its ability to find ways to help people become self-sustaining. It is their number one focus on all matters of helping the poor and needy and um, it's truly an inspiration to, 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 to be involved. It's part of the reason that I wanted to be on this subcommittee. So thank you for, for all of your efforts and in, in, in the way that you serve um, your fellow um, neighbors. Mr. Pabroki, uh Continuing on with one of the things, thank you so much for your focus on the benefits, Cliff. I mean, it is such a math problem that we should be able to, in Congress, address this. Uh, folks involved in this back in my state, in Utah, uh, we've graphed this out, and what it looks like is, is atrocious on how we disincentivize work so much in our benefits, Cliffs. Um, and it would be the one thing, if I had my magic wand, um, we should be able to solve this, and it's the one thing that in this, in this realm um, we, need to be, we need to do a better job of, of, of addressing. So thank you for your focus on it. I just introduced a bill. It's called the Returning Temporary to TANF Act, and what it's going to do is require states to just put 25% of the resources that they receive towards workforce-related issues. Can you speak to the value of, of, of keeping, um, you know, you do it in your second point about uh, apprenticeship programs. Uh, can you speak to the value of requiring resources towards workforce-related items to helping people um, get, get out of uh, the poverty situation that they're in? Well, th thank you, uh, Mr. Moore, for your question. Uh, you know, certainly the goal is, is ex exactly what members of this committee uh, have said, is, is how do we move people from poverty to prosperity? And there's a lot of steps towards that, right? And one of the difficulties we have just uh, front-loaded is all of the different webs of welfare, right? The federal programs have Medicaid, earned income tax credit, SNAP, child support, home energy uh, assistance, supplemental security, and the list goes on and on and on. Then you throw in uh, state-based assistance, and it continues to go on even further. And, you know, when you start looking at what does success look like, you know, if you go through a theory of change of, you know, inputs, uh, activities, outputs, success, well, how do you measure that on 40 different scales, right? They, they all conflict with each other, and that's why you have all of these cliffs. So I think actually, first and foremost, what your home state of Utah has done has been fantastic. They have a one-door policy where when you go in, they not only provide you with food and housing and those other things that are essential, but the goal is to try to get people to work. I think we got to expand that uh, outside of the state of Utah into the other 49 states. Uh, but to your question, uh, there's a huge gap. There's a huge gap with training. Uh, right now here in the state of Illinois, we have uh, 390,000 jobs available. We have 300,000 300, unemployed people, meaning that we have more than one job for every person right now, but there's a skills gap. And I think what you're talking about is making sure that some of the TANF dollars are dedicated towards training will go a huge way to make sure that we can take every one of those unemployed people and put them in high quality, high paying jobs. Thank you. Appreciate the comments on Utah. Um, it's good to hear it from someone outside the state because my colleagues are sick and tired of me saying it. Mr. Butler, uh, last, as I, as I wrap up here, 
oftentimes we hear about, well, we just need to put more money in this. We just need to do, you know, we would we would provide more more funding for these different types of programs. I, we can't just write more checks to this. We have more fundamental issues. Can you speak to um, the best way to serve people other than just money? Yeah, I think it's it, it comes back to getting people to the place where they can work. Uh, folks coming into the homeless shelters and, and the place that I work is, is getting those folks stable, then using that asset-based approach on, on how they want to move forward and then coming alongside of them and helping them to achieve that. Also, Mr. Panetta uh, brought up the fact that mental health, the mental health crisis in the United States of America is atrocious for the United States of America. When we have folks coming in that cannot care for themselves mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and they have to wait seven months or a year for an appointment to see a psychiatrist, it's absolutely, it's, it's, it's beyond belief that in the United States of America we have to put up with that. So addressing those issues, funding health clinics to, to provide more providers and clinicians to care for our mentally uh, unstable folks, I think it's, it's vital to getting people You took out. the closing piece I would like to say about my colleague from California, I appreciate that. Ms. Williams, also the focus on recidivism, is, it, 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 it's key to, to making sure people are built up to be able to take this on. Thank you, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Ms. Steele of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for all witnesses for sharing your experiences with us in Chicago. And I'm just so grateful. I'm a first generation Korean American. I was born in Korea and raised in Japan, so English is my third language. And I'm so grateful to this country. And you know what? We can fix this broken system, and we can reform it, and we can just fix this. I used to serve in Los Angeles for family and children's services, and we had about 75,000 children inside of the system. And after they hit 18, half of them become homeless people, and half of them, when they're getting out of the system, half actually becoming, um, joining gang members. So it was very dangerous. And I serve in actually Los Angeles, three cities, and I serve uh, about 12 cities in Orange County. We have 11 million people in Los Angeles. We have over 85,000 homeless people living there. And Orange County, 3.2 million people, and we have about 6,800 homeless people. So we really have to fix this. But I need the transition. So my question is, Mr. Montgomery, that you have almost a lifetime of experience helping individuals go from homelessness and government dependence to a job and self-sufficiency. Based on your work and experiences, can you describe how getting a job can transform a person's life, having transition? from the government assistance, and what is that makes the paycheck so much more rewarding than government assistance? Thank you very much, Congresswoman, for your question. Uh, you know, the one, uh, one positive experience we had with TANF over the years, because we had a lot of folks come and go, uh, many of whom, um, you know, really didn't last very long, but we had uh, a young man come in with his girlfriend. Each of them had a child from a prior relationship, and he actually uh, had an ankle bracelet from his latest engagement with the judicial system. And they were TANF earners, and, and the relationship was volatile. There were issues, and not the least of which was his alcoholism, and eventually it imploded. But he remained, and he kept working. It was a fantastic uh, volunteer. He, he had the best attitude. He was the friendliest. He did whatever you asked him to do. But we really started pouring into him more than anything, praise, just affirming who he was and what we saw and the capacity that was there. And so one day he came in and he somewhat sheepishly said he had gotten a job and it was at a fast food restaurant. And so he, he, wasn't, he felt like it wasn't that great of a job. But we praised him for that, right? We, we, we praised and celebrated that he had done this for himself. He had grown up in, a, in an unhealthy environment in which his inherent value and worth hadn't been affirmed and had never been celebrated. Within a year, he was running that location. He was a general manager, and he and his son then had their own home, and he was a more present father. It doesn't mean life stopped having its challenges, but who he saw himself as 
changed. Mm -hmm. But what I find more often than not, for that to happen, someone has to have someone else believe in them before they can believe in themselves. And unfortunately, the systems that we have created do the very opposite of that. Thank you. Thank you. In California, fast food workers are actually getting paid $20 minimum wage at this point. Um, Mr. Butler, uh, Pathway Ministries helps uh, thousands of individuals. They serve to obtain and maintain employment before they help place them in alternative and independent living arrangement. Pathway Ministries accepts no federal dollars, correct? Correct. And are there federal restrictions that make it impossible for you to carry out your work-focused uh, mission? Well, first, we're thankful that the government supplies uh, money and funding for programs and legislations to address poverty issues that we, that we have in our country and, and the oppression, including homelessness. Uh, but we're, we're a faith-based organization and we're a faith-forward organization and we desire to share the love of God and God's view of life with everyone we serve without restriction. While we don't ever force or coerce our belief system on anyone, we, we're meeting people where they're at. Uh, but we do want to share our beliefs and our perspective that Jesus is the answer to all of our brokenness. And because of our holistic approach, we don't want to create a distinction between the secular and the sacred because we believe part of our spiritual life is work and part of our spiritual life is the dignity that comes from work. And so focusing on those physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental aspects, while we could likely qualify for government funding for work readiness programs, uh, we just don't accept it because we want to keep the spirituality part in place with our work lives. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Steele. Um, that concludes our questions uh, this morning. Um, I want to just uh, relay what many of my colleagues have said and want to thank you for your testimony here today. Uh, you've been genuine and sincere and insightful and substantive and been very helpful to us as we take the information that we received from you today through the questions and answers, uh, through our, um, our, our site visit yesterday with Pastor Brooks at, at Project Hood, and being here today with, with Pastor Phil. Uh, we are grateful. And I think it also, um, it, you know, we live in the greatest country in the world. Um, and uh, there are people that don't always uh, see the benefits of living in the greatest country in the world. And so it's figuring out from a public policy standpoint, how do we bring more people into that? And uh, hearing particularly from you, Mr. Butler and Ms. Schofield, on your journey and your path, and you, Mr. Paprocki, on how you've been able to live that American dream and live in the greatest country in the world. And so that's what we need to think about. And we've heard some really wonderful things today about ending the, the benefits cliff and talking about tax credits for apprenticeships and looking at how we institute work requirements appropriately, looking at the mental health and behavioral health crisis, housing crisis, uh, re-entry from our prison population. Uh, now we have a responsibility to go back and try to work in a bipartisan way uh, to fix many of the problems we talked about here today and bring more people into living the American dream, which we can do in this country. So again, uh, Pastor Phil, thank you. Thank you to all of you. Uh, and I would just remind, I know the audience provided feedback. Uh, if you have not um, provided the feedback on the clipboards we, we get handed out, please give your suggestions so that we can have that feedback and take that back to Washington, D.C. And lastly, uh, members will be advised that we have two weeks to submit written questions to, the, to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, our committee Chairman, stands adjourned. Yes, Mr. Davis. Before you hit the gavel, let me thank you and Chairman Smith for bringing this hearing to Chicago. I know that you could have gone to Peoria. But the, I brought Peoria here. The, yeah, water, yeah. the waterway is not quite as large. But I also want to thank all of the witnesses, all of the people from the community who have come and been a part of this. It is indeed a historic setting. It's also a warmly regarded hearing where we've been able to share thoughts, ideas, and information with the understanding that we will continue to move to bring to the forefront those solutions rather than 
just the questions and the answers. So again, thank you and Chairman Smith for being in Chicago, if not the greatest country, but the greatest city in the United <laughs> States. Thank you. Well, well said, uh, Mr. Davis. And again, I want to thank all of you for your tremendous testimony here today. And our hearing is adjourned.